Buongiorno, everybody, and benvenuti to another episode of Cucina Quarantena. Uh, this is a, a mixed edition here because we've got my friend live from Florence Coral, who is hard into aperitivo hour. And here it is not quite noon, so I'm hard into a coffee hour. So good morning, buongiorno, or buona serata to you. How are you? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm good. <laughs> No, so same. right before we went on, we were just laughing a lot. So Cor wait, just to start. Okay, so Coral is my friend and she is a really amazing businesswoman and writer. And she writes for all kinds of really magnificent publications. And like you've written for what, Condé Nast Traveler, I think, right? And That's a bunch right. of other, <laughs> yeah, very prestigious writer. And she also runs her own food company, which is amazing because they do uh, live tours. You can go, if you're in Florence, you can go on a food tour. They also do remote stuff. So cooking classes and things like that. And she's also just a really good friend and Thanks. she's amazing. And I want you guys all to know her. And the thing that most impresses me, and I tell her this all the time, she started all of this herself. She was just an American student who loves Italy and she started this whole business herself and she lives in Florence. So just a little introduction to Miss Coral, but tell me a little bit about what we were just laughing about before we started. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Well, I just want to say you guys, are like, I'm sure that you, those of you that follow Sarah, love Sarah. She is uh, one of the, the most um, upstanding people in travel. And I can't, I'm so glad, I'm, I'm sure that those of you that follow her have taken a tour with her or have taken a tour with her and you're really lucky. Um, yeah, so thank you for the kind and generous introduction. So I was I was giggling because Sarah was like, "Oh, you look nice," and I'm like, "This is the disheveled me." Like eight hours later, because in Florence, um, so we're in the region of Tuscany, and I'm sure those of you who are like interested in Italy know that we're like in a color coded restriction system. So we're like in the yellow zone, which means that bars and restaurants and you know any sort of normal social activity can take place up until 6 p.m. And then there's a curfew at 10 p.m. And they really enforce it here. It's not like in the States um, where they say it and then they like don't enforce, it, <laughs> but like they actually really enforce it here. Um, and so like the police will be rolling by at like six o'clock. Cause you can even, if you're at like an outdoor bar or restaurant after six, they could give you a fine of 400 euros. So like as you, as the patron, not just to the restaurant tour. So there's this new cultural shift because Italians have never been into day drinking. Like they've a little bit into lunch drinking, like on the weekends or on Sundays. Um, but this has turned the whole culture upside down. Um, into like a drinking and eating culture of like before 6 p.m. kind of thing. Um, Which is like being, Amer like they're, we're turning them into Americans basically. The coronavirus is turning I've never them. seen so many brunch menus like until this this time. So brunch? It's, it's brunch, yeah, yeah, they're like, exactly. No, I mean, brunch has never really caught on until now because that's the time that we can do it. Um, so basically, I've been drinking all day and I'm not gonna be ashamed to say it because I thought, you know what? I'm gonna be honest to Sarah's like uh, followers because they deserve that. This is what we're all <laughs> are like right now. We are all day drinking in Italy. <laughs> and you know, a year- What else is there to do? <laughs> exactly. I think we get a pass. I think we get a pass. So uh, I'm gonna try not to do too much damage with this. <laughs> Knowing that I just- I didn't uh, think about that part of it, yeah. So, no, no, I'm okay. I, I haven't really like consumed that much, but um, it is the weekend and um, I, you know, I'm at home now. So I feel that I, I'm uh, quite in my, in my uh, limitations to, uh, to have a little bit of wine while I'm cooking drink with you. So we wanted to focus on art artichokes because they so are- So before we do, I just have one more question for you. So- yeah. Since you're in Florence and it's the yellow zone, which is the least restrictive zone at this point, are people out and socializing? Are, I mean, because I've been seeing some images of Rome and, and Sicily where it's it looks like it's a packed Saturday night. I saw a picture of Catania of people like just walking down the street, like thousands and thousands all in one place. So are people social distancing or not really? No, I mean, okay, so I have a couple mixed opinions. Okay, so one is that I, you know, I, it makes me a bit nervous because I have spent time on the, the West Coast during um, this period and I 
am quite impressed on how people on the West Coast uh, in cities like Seattle and San Francisco have have been acting and and like um, have been you know managing themselves like during the pandemic they've been very respectful um, so it's interesting to see that and then go here um, where I've spent some time and they're I mean yeah the social distancing rules are totally flouted uh, but I also have read some science that says that, uh, especially on the CDC website, says that your risk is really um, high when you're in contact with someone with like 15 minutes or more without a mask. So then um, considering here, everyone wears a mask, like that's never been a question. Um, whereas I feel like in the States that's still like being like, it's a contentious issue. Whereas like from the yeah. beginning, Italy's always worn a mask, but maybe they don't respect the social distancing. But if you're in public spaces and you're outdoors, and if this is true, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert, but if it's like 15 minutes, more, you know, more or less people that are outdoors and are walking in the streets and having their passeggiata, maybe they're not coming in contact that much. I personally feel like it's the gatherings that are happening in people's homes and that are happening in indoor restaurants. That's probably more of the more of the thing that we should be concerned about versus people walking around outdoors that are passing by each other for maybe a few moments at a time. But that's just my little, thank you for coming to my TED talk. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I noticed also when I was there in September that it was like people were really good about wearing masks and social distancing and all of that until I was with people that I know and then they were like, oh, no, no, come and give me a kiss. And I got all these slobbery kisses and I'm just like, yeah, this is exactly what they don't want us to do. <laughs> like slobbery wet kisses are, are not going to help. So yeah. Well, you were also here in the summer. So, okay, you were here in the summer and that was definitely like people were a little bit more relaxed because the cases were like, there are like a hundred cases in the entire country per day. So they felt like the, they had more of a chance of winning the lottery than like <laughs> if they give you a kiss. But now I definitely don't feel that people are doing that, like in terms of giving kisses and giving hugs. Um, yeah. They probably are a little bit more liberal in terms of gathering. But what I do notice, which it was just really um, comforting to me, is that a lot of people wear the N95 masks. I see that a lot in the surgical mask and the N95, a lot. Uh, whereas in the States, like I noticed that if people were wearing masks, um, maybe they were like the cloth masks and stuff like that. So, you know, I have to give Italians that, that they're definitely aware of the kind of protection to be wearing. But we don't have to talk about COVID this whole time. I know it's dominating all of our thoughts and like, it's it's like, we're all fatigued. Um, but I but wanted it's good to check in. It's good to check in because you're in Florence and I haven't talked to anybody in Italy online. I mean, I talk to people in Italy every day, but not as a live. So I just was interested to check in. No, no, no. And I hope this is interesting to your, like your audience too, you know, because yeah. I think that, you know, I think also this is what I would like to say to people in the States too, if they are like in the States, your audience, is I think I'm noticing this like, okay, this fatigue and this tendency to shame other people in the States. And I have to say like, okay, you have to look at a country like Italy has been affected really badly by the pandemic too. And you see that they are also like let their guard down in certain ways too, you know? And so it's like, um, okay, I, I get it that the US is so big and there's, I mean, I hear about things in other states where I'm like, what? Like, how are people like walking around with no mask and like yeah. going to restaurants and stuff? I'm, so, I'm sorry if this is like, you know, I'm not sorry, but you know, I know this could be kind of controversial kind of depending on who's watching, but, but I definitely do think that, yeah, here there are still some of those issues. And so it's not like uh, everyone in America is terrible you know, everyone's Italy is, or even in Europe, they're totally perfect. I mean, they're, you know, there's cultural things you have to battle with here because Italians are so social, you know, so um, they're willing to wear the mask, but in terms of like telling them not to gather and doing home gatherings, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, hold on, <laughs> like, you know, so it's also like an uphill battle. But then I, then I, I think the thing that compensates is that they enforce the rules. There's a sphere of getting a fine. Um, that I don't think that you live with in the States. Um, but anyway, this is just my observations for having seen, you know, having experienced the pandemic in both places. But anyway. Yeah, you know, well, coming back from September, I was out having a drink with a friend in Rome in Trust David, and it was really busy that night. There were lots of people out. 
and uh, they had a, a like a sweep, like a, a wall of uh, police walking through Chestevere, literally a wall combing and making sure everybody had masks on. And if you didn't, they came over and they yeah. said, put your mask on. And if you don't, you're going to get a big fine. So yeah, I mean, it was, it, you don't soon forget that <laughs> when the Italian police come over and remind you to put your mask on. I was, so, I was yes, sir, her, I so today that. in broad daylight, because our, you know, the curfew starts at six o'clock, but they still don't allow like assembramenti, like grouping or gathering. So I, I was on my bike and I saw um, some uh, patrols that on they had a jacket that said like you know basically what would translate into the police the police of gatherings so they have a special like of course they do of course they yeah. do <laughs> so I was like you know oh shit oh, I'm okay I'm gonna make them by myself I'm fine but like, you know you see like the figure of the you know police they have a special but also time Italy is very bureaucratic so it doesn't really surprise me that they have a special force to control you know, the, the, the gatherings outdoors. So that doesn't surprise anyway, me at all. I just don't think all right. that. Let's, let's, let's move on. I'm, I'm, I apologize for it. No, you don't need to apologize because I was very interested in knowing what was going on because I'd like to come back at some point, but I'm just curious, is it even worth it at this point? So we'll have to wait a little while until it's a little less weird. So until more people, well, we'll see how the until the vaccine efforts is not like a spilt can a spilt um pot of chili then i think that we can start a spilt pot of chili <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah that's a good way to put it yeah so we'll we'll see i have i've heard that the the rollout in italy has not been awesome so yeah Anywho, all right, so we are here today to talk to you about artichokes. It's a cucina quarantina just on what do you do with these buggers, because I have to tell you, I am intimidated by artichokes, and so I do not cook with them in my own kitchen because inevitably it doesn't turn out right. I buy the jarred ones usually because I, it takes all of the scratching of the hands and all that out. But when I'm in Italy, especially in the spring, especially in March, April, May, Every chef that I know there, when I arrange my dinners, I say, make everything you can think of out of artichokes because the way they prepare them is so good. I think here, the only way I'd ever had an artichoke in the States up until maybe 10 years ago was where they roast it and then you dip the individual leaves yeah. and you scrape off the meat with your teeth, which is just a lot of work. I mean, I remember my aunt doing that when I was a kid and thinking it was weird because she was really into health foods. And I was like, this is super weird. So, um, yeah, so artichokes, a lot of people just don't even know what to do with them. And so Coral has very kindly volunteered to show us what is it we do with artichokes. So um, I like the varieties that you have. Um, I wasn't prepared for that, which is good because why we're doing live. Because um, this guy that kind of gives an insight of, about the, the diversity that is in Italy. And, um, you know, even though in the West Coast we have really great variety um, and plethora of seasonal vegetables. Um, sometimes it's hard to find um, specific um, varieties that are intended for cooking or for, for raw consumption or, or, or um, salad. So a lot of times when I, I, you know, I shop at the Sant'Ambrogio market, which is the open air um, food market. And uh, a lot of, there's some like local growers there who like sell the things from their local farm. Um, sometimes there's people that sell it from like a local, like a, a central distribution center that buy their, their fruits and veg there. So um, right now we're in artichoke season in Italy and they're probably more known in the region of Lazio where Rome is capital. Uh, Rome has a, a, a large uh, tradition and repertoire with artichokes in their, in their cuisine. Tuscany, we have a, a bit of it too, but not like the Romans. Uh, the Romans take their artichokes very seriously. But we also have different varieties. So whenever you see, I mean, this is what I love about living in Italy is when I go to my market, even in Florence, so imagine in Rome, there's going to be even more of this where I see different varieties of artichokes. I'm like, oh, which one should I buy to cook with or to eat raw? Because they're going to have a different use for, for each of them. Yeah. Um, or which one should I do to fry? Or you, you know what I mean? So I got this from my trusted fruit and veg vendor. And he just said that this could be used for uh, raw or to be cooked, but yours is completely different from mine. So this will be an experiment also for me. I have never seen this variety in Florence, although I have seen them in the States. 
So this it's is the, the only variety. I actually went to Sprouts because I thought, you know, Safeway or QFC or whatever is not going to have artichokes at all, probably. And really? Sprouts did have them, but this is the only kind I think I've ever seen here in the uh, US. So. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Because, okay, yeah. what you do. So there's a few things to keep in mind. And we'll, we'll keep this fairly short in terms of how to prepare an artichoke and then give you some ideas of what to do with them afterwards. But I think in terms of when you are preparing an artichoke and if you can go to a farmer's market and if you do see, see them at a farmer's market, ask the farmer, would this artichoke be uh, adequate for uh, raw or for salads or for cooking? One so, other thing to note though, I have to tell you, I, I just started my spring vegetables in my greenhouse and I thought, oh, it would be actually really fun to order artichokes because uh, that's something that's like a perennial. So if I start it now in my greenhouse then I can even have it next spring. And the only variety that I could find was this one. So I don't even know if they, if, I mean, maybe if you went to a specialty seeds thing, you could do that. But I'm thinking about like my favorite kind of artichokes are the baby ones that you find. And you can find them in any grocery store in Italy where they're small. They're like only this big and they come in like a meat tray. And yeah. then you dice them really finely and you can use them as a sauce and all that. And those are tender and so good. That's why I wanted to plant them in my yard so that I could see if I could grow little baby ones. But Anyway, so just as a, as a warning to the people watching, if you, if you live in the States, this is probably your only choice. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, fair enough. I wonder, because uh, I wonder if it's any different for, the, for people who are in Northern California or in California in general, just since Maybe. To like agriculture. I mean, not just, I mean, agriculture in Washington State is pretty good, but I just feel like in California, sometimes you, you can get more variety of things. I've seen uh, Italian varieties of vegetables that I never even heard of in Italy, but that people were reviving in the Bay Area, you know, so you just, you never know. But no, no, I, I agree with you. That's what I've seen the most, but let's pretend like you can cook with the ones that you've gotten. So one, okay, okay two three things that you should always have when you are preparing our chips is a bowl that you fill with water um, and either lemon or tomato. So I didn't tell you this, Sarah, I forgot, but I had mentioned that you would, when you're preparing artichokes, um, they tend to oxidize quite quickly. And so what you want to do with the ones that you've already prepared, you want to put them in this bowl of water and you could either squeeze half of a lemon inside or a little trick that I've learned is to take some tomato and I mean it's kind of wintry time but um you know in case you have tomatoes on hand is that you can cut them and then squeeze them into the water and that also acid acidulates the water as you'd say uh, in case you don't have a lemon around uh I don't know why you wouldn't have a lemon they're really easy to find and I think it's kind of a waste of a tomato considering tomatoes are so expensive in the states but that's another thing you can do is so so what I do, yeah, all I'm gonna fill this up with water real quick. Uh, and also what I do is I save the, the leg, I guess you'd say, because um, when, as soon as you take all the leaves off, you need to put it in the water immediately in the acid dilated water. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. I speak two languages, give me a break. Um, so when I say acid dilated uh, with like the lemon or the tomato, you want to put it in the water immediately and sometimes because once you've taken off the stalk and leaves it can float and so the stalk puts weight on top of the artichoke inside the water so it doesn't float from the top and then expose itself to oxygen if that makes sense so step one i've got my bowl that has water yeah. so step one is to make sure that you have either a, i'm going to use tomato this time because i have yeah you can use lemon i'm using tomato just because uh, i have smaller ones and I, so just a little, just a little squeeze of lemon juice then, right? I'm going to, um, I'll show you guys what I've got here. So I would do half of the lemon. Yeah. Half of the lemon. Okay. Yeah. And squeeze the lemon juice into the water and then leave the lemon inside of the water. Okay. This, I, as I pointed out to Coral just a few minutes ago, this incredibly beautiful cutting board was made by my children for Christmas. This was their Christmas present uh, to me courtesy of their uncle Mike, who's a really, really good woodworker. That's very okay, awesome. so. Yeah, now that you have the acidulated water, you can just, yeah, I, leave you know, I love, I love when you say that stuff, Coral, honestly, because I think that way too. And 
I've had, you know, you and I've had many conversations about why it is that we get get along because we kind of get the same weirdness in our heads. And there are certain words that I swear are words, but I know are not words like um, uh, climatized. I don't think that's a word, you know? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not a word, but we say that in English Italian, right? <laughs> yeah, you would say that in Italian, but it wouldn't make much sense in, in, uh, in, in I'm not sure that that's a word in English. I've never, I can't really tell climatized. I don't know if that's, Anyway, oh, what, but that's just one example. <laughs> what are you using to send in terms of a situation? What? What situation are you using this word? Cl is is the, the house climatized, right? Uh, uh, so you could say whatever. What is it? Like temperature controlled or like climate controlled? Air, con air conditioned or something. But it, there's not exactly the right word. Climatized is better ah. than air conditioned or whatever. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah so that's the problem. Uh, okay, no, no. That's the problem is that so many times there are actually words in Italian that may, make more sense than an English word. And so that's why my brain turns into soup sometimes. Like yours, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, I feel like you're anyway. Uh, okay, so now you have your acidulated. I'm, okay, so I'm using, um, so I have, you know, this, this, bowl, this bowl and I'm, you know, kind of like, putting the tomato, I diced it and I'm kind of squeezing it as if it were lemon just to, you know, get the acid in there. Um, again, you could, I think a lemon's probably more ideal, but just in case you happen to have tomato around and you didn't have um, a lemon. So anyways, yeah, have that. And then what you do is um, like, I cut off most of the, the stem, so I can cut off probably a little bit more. Um, so here, so what you're gonna do so, so basically ways. all of the stem, right? Yeah. To the base. Except okay. Like a little base, yeah. Um, so I'm basically, oh, well, another thing you can do is cut here. I'm going to cut the tip off. Here. So this is for if you're this right here. Ooh, that's pointy. Yeah. So this right here. Yeah. So I cut off a bit of my, my tip. Oh, wow. Okay. Quite a bit. Yeah. And then um, I'm kind of like, this is, there's a lot of food waste here, which I'm very open. I know that you could probably make a broth with these, these, these leaves, because I really get sad about food waste, but they're so tough that there's really not much you can do with them, except what the American way of like, um, you know, eating the you know, steaming. So I can see that I've, I've cut down to just about the tip of where yeah. the heart starts. Is that yeah. enough or should I cut yeah. further? That's good. I would okay. say that everyone has, you know, of course their own method, but okay. So now I feel like I'm at the, so where it doesn't really feel so much like they're, okay. I don't know if you can see, but these. So you, you have also picked off all of the exterior leaves, which I haven't yeah. done that. You took off most exterior leaves until you feel like the, you've gotten to the heart of it where you can see more of like this inside. I, again, I'm very much against the food waste. I know that some people, they, it's going to be bitter, these bits, um, but I, I kind of stop here uh, because I know that you can still kind of eat them if you cook them down a lot. Um, but By the way, I'm not acting stupid about this. I literally don't know how to prepare artichokes. <laughs> so I'm yeah. learning as we're going along. Hold that up again. Let me see how far, because this is how far I've gone. Do I need to take more leaves off? Let me see the, let me see. Um, hmm, that looks kind of big. Uh, gone a little bit? Yeah, a little, well, maybe a little bit more. Here, let's see. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I have a heart. If, if we're working with the same artichoke, it'd be a little bit. Yeah. I think that's good. I think that's good. So that, okay. Now that we kind of gotten to the, no pun intended to the heart of, of the matter. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> is I kind of use a paring knife. Sorry. People are like, why is this drunk girl playing with knives? I'm a <laughs> Don't try this at home. I'm just a professional drunk. Um, not a professional drink. That's not something that you would want to be proud of. Anyways, um, <laughs> so what I would do is take a paring knife to get like some of these things off. Yours will not, here, let me do it first and I'll show you. 
No, I just did it actually, because I could tell that there were still some rough parts. And I yeah. know that the yummy part that you're going to eat is really yeah. this base here and then the interior. So you want to trim off, I, yeah. I, I'm uh -huh. guessing, you want to yeah. trim off all the rough stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. So you just want to trim off the more rough parts. And uh, so let me get, and I like to do a, use a paring knife with these things to get, because they tend to be more precise. Uh, so this is this is my this is my artichoke, if you can tell. So I use a paring knife to shave off like all of the kind of rougher parts to get to the the nice tender bits of the artichoke. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, and I'm wondering if I need to go a little bit further into. When you start to feel it being a bit tender, where you could like honestly you have to lose, use a little bit of intuition, like would you eat this? Once you cut into it and you're like, hey, I would eat this raw, then that's when you kind of know when you're 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 done. Yeah, and I think that I can see that that's I need to do maybe one more layer, but yeah, I can feel that the texture is completely different here than it was. Yeah, like right now the texture has completely changed and it's a little bit more soft and rubbery. Yeah, like these exactly. are that's super leathery, but this yeah. is more uh -huh. kind of gentle and rubbery. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's awful. Okay. So cool. then what I do then is I then cut it in half. Okay. You can do it whole too. So now I have these, these little, little babes, and then I put them in the water immediately because they could start to oxidize and then put the, the, the stem on top to keep as like a weight. So hold on, I don't know if you can see, but I, so I have this bowl of, hold on, let me, um, yeah, oh, but I, I love technology. Okay, so <laughs> now I use kind of like the stem to hold down because I can float to the top of it. So I use the stem. I never throw it. This is what I love about Tuscany. They never throw anything away. So when I'm buying these at the market, I ask them to keep the stems because they act as like a paperweight almost. So they can no, I can't get it to do it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't want to do it here because it keeps flopping over. My stems are too short, I think. Ah. Uh, Oh, okay. So my little little deviation that I'm going to do, let me see if I can get my computer to show, is instead of putting them in so that it's like the bump side up, I'm putting it cut side up because then the majority of it is submerged. I, I don't know why I did it that way, but you know, drum kitchen. Okay. <laughs> Cucina Ubriaca, right? <laughs> We'll come up with a new concept. I've been doing Cucina Quarantena, but at this point, it's just Cucina Ubriaca, I think. Which sounds a little bit like, well, yeah, you're right. Yeah, Cucina Drum. I like it in Italian. It sounds nicer. It sounds classier. Like, Cucina Ubriaca. Yeah. Or you're like, you know what? I, there is that whole drunk history thing, and people love that, but I'm not sure that there's a drunk cooking show because playing with knives while you've been drinking is probably not wise, but but it's a great concept. I have a feeling people would love it. I, I mean, there's I'm a bit tipsy, so there's a difference between being, you know, inebriated. I, I do not, this is why I do not um, advise this. Don't do this at home, kids. <laughs> <laughs> do as I say and not as I do. That's what I tell my children. Do as I say and not as I do. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to be like me, so please don't. <laughs> so the right, I'm going to do a second one. Should I move on to another one? Sure. Yeah, if you want to make two. So I, I'm going to keep it at one just because, okay, so the reason why I, I advise for this, like, um, bowl underwater acid dilated water thing is if you're preparing more artichokes since as you can tell for those of you that started out with like a large artichoke artichoke you probably remained with very little product so yeah. you need to clean that but because they oxidize so quickly you need to immediately put them into this like acid dil acid dilated water right so as you're working with more artichokes and you need to like put it you know preserve it otherwise they're going to turn um they're going to like get mucky uh really quickly so I'm only doing one. I mean, you're probably cooking for the family. So it's, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wait till you catch up a bit. Yeah, I'm just going to do two. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. The, the, the kid knows one of them's not even awake yet, you know, 16 year olds. So Saturday morning. We stayed up late last night watching Coming to America, which my kids had never seen before. And they thought was the most like sweet movie they've ever seen. They thought it was such a sweet movie. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I thought that was added to Netflix just recently. Like, yeah. 
I'm like, oh, that one's been out for a while. Yeah, they totally love that movie. It's it's so much. This is one of the fun things about this whole like being stuck in the house constantly thing is thinking about movies my kids have never seen, like Gone with the Wind we watched last week. So Ooh, what do they think? Yeah. So what are all the classics? That's what I've been. I'm trying to think about what are what are the classics that they would enjoy. I think since Luke is studying French, we're going to watch the Jean Pierre Jeunet ones, like uh, City of Lost Children and all that. Okay. I interesting to see those movies now because they're so problematic you're like whoa this is not okay well and that's actually one of the things i loved about watching coming to america is that it was one of the few 80s movies that i've shown them that wasn't like oh god i need to turn this off like i remember loving the movie weird science when i was a kid and i watched that with the kids and i was like oh my god turn this off this is awful <laughs> like i had no no clue that times had changed that much Okay, so here's my next attempt. Does that look right? Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your artichokes look like more what you would do Roman style, which is they would stuff it with herbs and oil and garlic. But yeah, put it in the water because I can already see it turning. But maybe that's just me. But yeah. Oh, no, yeah. It turns brown like immediately. Yeah. Super fast. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what, what are we doing next? Okay. So it depends. So what people, it depends on what people want to do with them. So if I, okay, I really like to make these with pasta, you, but in restaurants in Florence, they tend to, to quarter them and batter them and fry them. Um, but since I don't, I don't know if people want to fry them, um, it's so easy it, to take them out. So, you know, app when you're ready to slice them up here, I'll, let me see. I think you can see now. Yeah. Yeah, I so, can see. What you doing? So uh, it's really essential to have a good sharp knife and then not knock anything over and not cut your, your thumb. <laughs> <laughs> that is important. Yes. And I'm sitting on my knees on. Yeah. So this, um, so, okay. Now you have raw, you have thinly sliced pieces of artichoke. So there's a few things you can do with this. One is you could lay this atop um, cured meats like lonzo um, or like prosciutto and have this on top. Uh, so have like a, a bed of like prosciutto with the crudo and then put olive oil and parmigiano on top. So just or, raw. So we're not cooking it. Raw. raw, okay. All right. Later. I'm gonna do them right I, now. Try, I think I try eating one raw because I don't think I've ever eaten <laughs> just a raw. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Bitter? What does that taste like? It has a completely different taste than it does. What is that taste? Tannin. It's like drying out your mouth. Mm, yeah. Tannin. Artichokes are really high in tannin. It's not quite carrot mm. there's so, a very specific flavor that i'm i'm getting that i can't it's like a sulfur almost I, I don't know if it's sulfur but but it's they're they're very high in that mouth drying tannin effect that when you eat things like asparagus or um or root, like like broccoli things like that that have a high sulfur content um and so as a result artichokes are very difficult to pair with wine because of they have a very uh, they have a very high content of this compound that kind of dries out your mouth. Um, so you can eat them. Like I said, I love them raw on carpaccio, and then you drizzle good oil and some shavings of parmigiano. That's good. Um, or you can keep slicing them and then get, get a pan. Sorry, I mean I don't know if I need to show this per se, but okay. Right. Get you a pan. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm slicing. So I'm just going to slice up a couple. And we're going to, is the, the frying them is just, we're just going to do one preparation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, let me. So let I'm going to go ahead and just cut all, all of my up. You're going to smaller pan. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So I'm going to put some olive oil in here. So, oh, did you get pasta chili? Yeah, I did. I forgot. I got your text message as I was uh, getting back in the car. So. Oh, no worries. Okay, so there's two. And normally I have bacon in the house, but I think we are 
out of the bacon. So we're going to go all natural. I thought I'd just do olive oil and uh, lemon. Yeah, oh, garlic. I would do garlic. Yeah, I would just do a little. So um, like garlic, a little bit of chili flake, and then these. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me put. This is not nearly as scary as I thought it would be because I don't know why I just have had bad experiences working with artichokes and I gave up on them entirely. So, and the last time I asked a, a chef I know in Sicily to make a whole bunch of artichokes, she had band-aids all over her hands at the end of the night because she herself. Yeah, because they were so they were so spiny. You need a good knife. I think that's part of it. Um, you need to keep it sharp too. Um, I'm like a big proponent of keeping your knife sharp. Um, so which you can, if, even if you're in the States, you can find a butcher and a butcher will sharpen your knife for you. So, um, ah, your, yes. yeah, I think the knife sharpness is a huge, a huge deal. So I'm going to chop up a little bit of garlic since you don't have, but if you, if any of you who have guanciale or pancetta or rigatino, um, you can, put that in the pan and then add the artichokes and just cook it down with olive oil. Uh, if you, when you see it getting a bit dry, just cook it down until it softens and then you can toss it with pasta. And it's, it's that simple. Like it sounds really like, um, oh wow, it's complicated. But as long as you know how to prep artichokes or so, it's really simple. So a couple of things, uh, you talked about sharpening knives and I just wanted to show people, this is a little device you can get on Amazon. It costs about $6. And I keep it in my drawer. And I would say once a month, I grab my knives and I give them just a quick go over. And so basically what you do, you've got the um, coarse grain and the fine grain. And what you're gonna do is go a few passes through each one, starting with the coarse. So you just go back and forth. And then I usually like to just kind of take off some of the like filings, like with a cloth through my fingers, and then you go through the next one. This is just good maintenance. You don't have to be super good at this. I worked at a cook, uh, at a cooking shop years ago, um, oh, which is why I have such a collection of cookware. Anyway, that's how what I learned. So cheap little trick here. You can get them on Amazon or at you know your local cooking shop for practically nothing. The other thing I'm going to do that's di divergent from uh, coral, I'm going to just use Trader Joe's Cheaters garlic because I'm lazy. So that's okay. There you go. Um, pandemic. <laughs> It's, it's, you, you, have, you've uh, gotten the, the garlic at Trader Joe's before, haven't you? The kind that's already like three minutes. Yeah, it's so it's wonderfully lazy. I talked to okay, a lot of people. So in the, so one of the secret like um, shortcuts are is like pre minced garlic or like pre peeled garlic because they're they're a pain. Let's be honest. So I kind of chopped one here. Up. Actually, I like better than you. You can get the jars where they've minced the garlic into olive oil, and I don't like the flavor of that. This is just garlic that's been pureed and put into this. And you could, if you were somebody who was really thrifty, you could do it yourself. But this is so cheap. This is like two bucks to Trader Joe's. Oh, bless Trader. Trader yeah, Joe's. I know. One of the other things about like, why don't I live in Italy right now is that, yeah, they don't have Trader Joe's. So where would I grocery shop? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I would say if, if Italy could get some respectable Mexican food and had a Trader Joe's, I think I'd be ready to move. Oh man, I don't understand the Mexican food part because there's like, there's, you can get like good Indian food, you can get good um, Persian food, Georgian food, but in Mexican food, no. You can get Peruvian food, but not, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. Um, Have you tried that place near to your house? Is that any good? The Persian or the uh, Georgian oh, place? The Mexican, there's that, that Mexican taqueria place that is um, when oh, you walk no. from your house to the Duomo. No. 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 <laughs> I'm going to say no. It looks terrible, which is why I've never gone in, but maybe it's good. I mean, who knows? There's um, actually an Australian like cafe bistro that makes really good carnitas. And uh, they make homemade tacos and shells. So I mean, I I've heard that really good place, good things about that place. But okay, so sorry. I just want to show people that I. Um, Cutting board right now, my friend. 
I don't know if people can see. This is, yeah, this is my Italian kitchen with my lawn, my washing machine in the same area as my, my kitchen. I just thought that that might be interesting for people watching. Um, and that's completely normal, by the way, for people out there watching that, uh, for people to have their washing machine in their kitchen, I would say <laughs> half, the, I mean, the, the apartment I lived in in Rome had that, I would say half of the Airbnbs that I've gotten or friends' houses, it's the same. People will have their washing machine. And when I first moved into my apartment in 1995 in Rome, I saw that I'd never seen a front loader washing machine and it was in my kitchen. And I was like, do I put food in that? Yeah. <laughs> That's some sort of fancy Italian like pasta maker. I didn't know what it was. My mother had to show me how to use it. <laughs> oh, the joys of, of adjusting. So all right, so I've got my garlic and my olive oil nice and hot. So should I just toss in all the artichokes? Yeah, and then if you have white wine, I would add like a dash of white wine to your um, your artichoke. Sugo, if you, if you have it. I don't have white, I have red. Would that work? Huh? I have red, I not white. Would that still work? Mm, I would, I would maybe it's add- It's probably turn it a weird color. You know what? I would even add more of the, uh, uh, more of a spritz of the lemon than, than red wine, honestly, because white wine would be better with this. Yeah, and so, red wine will turn it a weird color. Yeah, and then a weird taste too. So I'm using, I'm using the tomato from, which is probably breaking all sorts of rules, but it gives it some acid, um, which is what we what we want. That's why the white wine would, would help for some of the acid. Well, I would say so far, this is not nearly as scary as I thought that cooking with artichokes would. It's so simple. Once, yeah, once, um, I think that I was really intimidated too, but, um, but then when I, I learned just that you, this is how you clean them, because I saw so many different varieties of artichokes and I got tired of eating them only in restaurants, that I wanted to cook them at home. Yeah. Um, then it, it kind of opened up, you know, World a little bit. Um, so yeah, I would just cook these again. If you have white wine, it's probably ideal. Um, and just because the white one will help to break it down too a little bit. So I would just cook it down until it seems really soft, and then um, you can put that on top of. Um, tell me, tell me, sorry. No, I'm wondering, as a substitute for white wine, if you want a little more liquid to cook them down, maybe a little bit of chicken broth would work. Uh, I'm a bit of a purist, okay. but try it and see. Or maybe just water. Mm -hmm. No? You don't have any white wine? Do you, do you not know me at all, Coral? <laughs> Who drinks white wine in this house? Uh, prosecco? I know you have Prosecco. <laughs> oh, I that. Okay, that's true. Hmm. Let's see. If you're gonna add yeah, no. water, I would be add a, really very, that. a little amount, and I would I would wait. You know what? If I, uh huh. Sorry. I think what I should do is I should, next time I go to Trader Joe's, I should get one of those little bricks of white box wine and just keep it in my pantry for cooking. Yeah. I think so. And then try to also like, um, I think like, yeah, I think the, yeah, the white wine, I, I have a little bit of rosé. I'll add, uh, <laughs> it's like, are probably cringing right now. They're like, <laughs> I'm like, what is she doing? <laughs> No, but this is why we call this Pacina Quarantena because it's cooking with whatever you have in your house. And if it's not chef appropriate, that's absolutely fine. We're doing high cuisine with what we've got on hand. That's yeah, point. yeah. I, white wine would be better. Let's see. Um, because because there's not as much acid with red wine. That's the problem. It's not that you just need wine for the sake of wine. You need the wine for the acid. So usually red wine is low in acid. 
I that's got white vermouth. Would white huh? vermouth work? Would white vermouth work? Unless it was, well, no, because they add spices or sugar to it sometimes. Yeah. Oh, even if you, you juice the rest of the lemon and then add a little bit of water, even that would be better. Yeah, I would say that. Brava, brava. Okay, I'll get a little one. I added some of the acidulated water to mine because I it's kind of cold, so I also just have red wine. So I hear you. I hear them not having that. Smells really good. I mean, I don't know how it's gonna taste, but it smells really good. What's that? They definitely seem like they're not soft yet. So we, we want to go for real soft, right? Yeah. Very fibrous. And then once this is, it probably take about 20 minutes. So, you know, we don't have to be on the call the entire time, but they have to be very, very soft. And then what I, okay. So for those who have access to guanciale or pancetta, first I would cut the pancetta or the guanciale in really small pieces, like little small strips or small cubes, ideally small strips, and put it in the pan first before adding the artichokes. And then you're cooking like the guanciale and the artichokes all together. And oh. that will be really flavorful. And then once, like I, like I said, 20 minutes max is what it's gonna take for those artichokes to cook down and get soft. Then all you do is cook pasta in this other pot that you have, I see. And then just toss it with pasta. Like it's, it's just so simple. It's incredible. Wow. That actually has not been nearly as difficult as I would have predicted because I, like I said, I've always found um, artichokes to be very scary, you know, cause they're so spiny and I don't really know what to do with them. And there seems like there's a lot of waste and all that kind of stuff, but this is actually really easy. So um, different other things that I think I've seen done with artichokes that I thought were good. I think the pasta sauce is a really good one. I'm, and if, for those of you watching that don't know what guanciale is or don't have access to that, bacon's okay too. Just take bacon and dice up the bacon. Um, I've also seen frittata like this where people, they take the, the artichokes and then they mix it in with eggs and make basically like an omelet. What other kind of preparations have you seen? Um, so, um, in Tuscany fried or, um, they stuff them with like what you did halfway and you, so instead of cup, cutting them in half, you, you know, you cut the top, like the top bit off the tip and you have the whole bulb and then you stuff with garlic and herbs. And that's like alla romana. Um, that's like pretty popular or well, alla romana also they, they fry it like with no flour. They just like put it in the fryer and it blooms a bit. Um, yeah, that's the, Jew the Jewish artichokes in Rome, right? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so I think I was confusing like the fried and the like the Jewish, uh, la Judea. La Judea is the one with the, where they, they, I think they fry. Yeah. These are already really good. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then you can chop some parsley on the pasta to kind of just give it some earthy, like herbalness or green. Yeah, so. Yeah, I've even had um, some restaurateurs have served them where they just make them so good like this. They they boil them down until they're really, really soft. I think they must really slow simmer them for a long time. And they just serve that as a, like a vegetable side dish, a pile of these with a little bit of uh, olive oil and salt. Mm. So good. Just as a vegetable side. Dang. Yeah, this is definitely demystified artichokes for me, Coral. You've added to my repertoire. Yeah. yeah, I'm done. So if I wanted to, I could add them to pasta and some more olive oil and Parmesan, and that would be like a quick pasta dish. Well, and so. that's really the beauty of cooking Italian food. And I think you and I both appreciate the fact that, you know, Italians have all this wonderful, beautiful produce, but what's most important is that they don't like over prepare stuff. They prepare stuff in such a simple way that it highlights the produce. But also what's cool for the home cook is this stuff is actually really easy, right? Yes. Yeah, I agree. And I have a, so um, I think
think I mentioned I'm doing like the, like virtual cooking classes as part of you know my pivots and all that. So um, I noticed. So I do. Um, we have the next few weeks of themes. Like I think next week is something like gnocchi and a meat sauce, and then like tagliatelle with porcini, and then we have uh, a pasta with artichokes. There was only two people that signed up with the one with artichokes. And I have a feeling it's because they're like, what do I do with that? Whereas all the other ones have like almost, they're like all booked. So that's the only one. And it's well in advance. It's not because it's like just coming up. So I think, yeah, like artichokes, I, I think, I wonder if it's like artichokes are very like, oh, it's like, ah. Uh, people literally difficult. don't know what to do with them. I mean, I've gotten them in my vegetable boxes and I know how to cook pretty well, yeah, but I get them and I'm just like, Hmm. <laughs> Not excited about this. I've steamed them with and had the leaves with the garlic butter for my kids just so they could try it. But yeah, um, but this is actually really wonderful. And this, I would say, is my favorite food to eat in Italy in the spring. So if you're in Italy in March or April, especially in Sicily, it's crazy when you're in Sicily because you drive down the road and they'll have these like um, trucks with these huge bundles like this big where you can barely put your arms around them for a euro. What? Yeah, yeah you, you need to spend more time in Sicily, sister, because the, the produce down there is so cheap and it's like the most beautiful, like it looks like it's on steroids, like the, the artichokes down there, they're huge. So that's why when I'm in Sicily and I'm working down there, I'm always making sure that in the spring we have artichokes on the table because- I've never thought of artichokes. I've always associated with artichokes with, with Rome. And then when, and then of course, in you know, Tuscany we have them. Um, but, I think they're grown in Sicily. I mean, I think you should look next time you go to the market and see where they're grown. I'm pretty sure they're grown in Sicily. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Tuscany grows some, the, um, some Nostrali, which are the smaller ones, which we tend to grow here. But I'm curious, yeah, no, I feel like when I've been to Sicily and eaten the produce there, I've been so blown away that when I've gone back to Tuscany, I have that effect when I go to the States and taste the produce. I'm like, oh, this tastes like nothing. The Tuscan produce tastes like nothing compared to the Sicilian produce. It's true. I mean, the flavors are so, well. Everything in Sicily is more intense, and it, and that for sure is true. That the flavors <laughs> of the produce are more intense. So, yeah. Um, wow, this is just fantastic. So, um, you're going to do your cooking classes. So, you basically your business, since your business is you know not working right now, since there aren't any tourists, you pivoted to doing online experiences. Tell me about this gnocchi thing. I may want to do that. When is the sure. gnocchi thing? Yeah. So I um, suck at making gnocchi. I'm terrible at it. Oh, why? They, well, I know what it is, is the, the trick to it is like having a really gentle hand, using the right potatoes. There's all these little things you need. Yeah. I've had people try to teach me before. They always turn out like little hard rocks. So that's a oh. class I may want to drop in on. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me know. I think, um, may, I don't know if it's this, is it tomorrow or... It's not, it's not next week. It's probably tomorrow or the following weekend. I'll have to find out. Well, let me know when um, that is. I, I'd love to check that one out. So, yeah. so you've basically taken all of your experts who do food tours with you normally, and you're having them do virtual experiences with people, right? Yeah, 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 basically, yeah. And it's great because um, the, I, um, you know, I, I love food and I love cooking, but I definitely am like, you know, I'm going to leave it to the experts, the, the gatekeepers of Italian cuisine to teach those cooking classes. Um, and so I work with, you know, like Florentine mamas that have like she mama chefs who have been born and raised here and everything who, you know, like have learned the recipes from their parents who are culinary like experts. And I, I mean, cause I'm, I don't know. I, for me, I don't, again, I'm an enthusiast, but I don't feel um, in the time in grado, like I don't feel up to par to teach a lesson so I would rather I want the person who's a who's a gatekeeper of their family recipe to teach those recipes to people so, so where uh, did you learn to cook then because I know I learned from my professor in college she taught us all how to cook that was like part of our coursework was to learn how to cook like a real Italian so where did you learn how to cook from these like okay so because when I first moved here um you know I I uh I worked for different companies that organized like you know um cooking classes and cooking experiences that are translated. They were all like kind of grandmas and mothers who didn't speak English and I would translate the cooking classes. And honestly, they like that, that's who taught me how to cook Italian. Um, and then I, I, I grew like this, you know, in, 
enormous respect for like Italian mamas, you know, in terms of passing on those traditions to people. So I decided that like, I want to work with like these like figures um, to give cooking classes to, you know, my travelers, I guess. So they've been ho hosting cooking classes in their home to my clients, but obviously, yeah, with the pandemic, it's not possible. So they've been doing, I've been organizing uh, them with the cooking classes and it's great because, you know, um, I'm sure you can imagine like, um, you know, <laughs> organizing things online with a, a country like Italy is not the easiest thing to do. I'm actually very impressed with the amount of online learning that Italy has been able to do because it's like you people don't understand that like a lot of people live in the countryside they don't have a good internet connection let alone they have a good computer you know other things so you know doing things remotely has been a huge learning curve for the Italian culture you know and they really have stepped up in a lot of ways um so um yeah so we like I said my the cooking class instructors that would normally do them in person now do them online and I work with clients to develop menus and I'm kind of like the cultural mediator, I guess you could say, because I kind of have an idea of what people might want to do. And then I, you know, talk with the instructor and we try to find like a middle the liaison. Company. Well, and that's always the kind of thing that I've, I've thought of myself as well as I'm a, I'm a cultural interpreter, not just like a language interpreter, but a cultural interpreter, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to show everybody where I'm at. I think these are getting close to being done. I added some water to them to, and the water actually is not a bad idea because then it gets all that fond, all that kind of yummy sticky stuff off of the pan. So it's actually produced kind of a nice little kind of brodo there you can see. And so that's just going to boil off, I think. And then once that's yeah. boiled off, I think we're done, right? Yeah, yeah. I would have I yeah. also added to the water that had the lemon in it just to add that in there because it has, it's kind of like you know, acidic water, you could have added to it too. Yeah, I did. I added a lot of lemon juice and salt as well. And they're really delicious. And what's interesting uh, it's especially a real um, unique flavor. It's a different flavor. So this is a, a really fun taste treat. And it's something that most people probably have never tasted exactly like this. So it's a good project and didn't take that long. Only took us half hour basically, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you're boiling pasta in the meantime, you just like make yourself an artichoke pasta. Yeah, like, that was actually nice. super easy. Cool. All right, my friend Coral, this has been really, really fun. And I hope that you will join us again another Saturday after you've gone out um, for aperitivo, you can come in and teach us something else to make for dinner. <laughs> I hope you all have liked my tipsy cooking. <laughs> yeah, so uh, thank you for all of you for watching uh, Cucina Ubriaca this evening, Stasera. So <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, now you're going to go out. You're, you're a young, pretty girl. You're going to go out now and you're going to meet some handsome Italian man at a bar, go walk through beautiful streets, but you can't, right? Well, <laughs> there's several problems with that scenario. But you're not allowed to leave your house, right? Not allowed. No. Now we're what? What time is it? It's okay. Fifteen minutes till curfew. Yeah, we're at like a curfew at ten p.m. Oh no. Past ten p.m. But also, you know, the probably they had some Italian men at their mother's house. So. Uh, True. Burn. Yeah, Italian men. That's a whole another topic that we could we could talk about one day. <laughs> I would definitely need a few drinks before having that conversation. So. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So All right, darling. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And those of you who are watching, if you're curious about what, uh, if you're curious about what it is that Coral does, you can go to her website, Curious Appetite. Right? Was it curious curiousappetite.com? Well, the curiousappetite.com or curiousappetitetravel.com, or you can just find me on social media at Curious Appetite. Okay, and um, you, her name's again Coral Sisk, and you can find her in all kinds of, if you Google her, she's written all kinds of articles for lots of different publications. She's a great food writer, and one of the business women I admire most who's done so many amazing things just building it all by herself. So I love it when we have a chance to support independent business women who are out there doing the thing and working hard and, you know, hustling like me. So Coral and I are kind of like uh, each other's spirit animal, I think, right? <laughs> Sarah, I feel so 
You guys are really well, I hope to actually be there and going out and having an aperitivo with you within the next couple of months. So that's my goal is I'm going to get out there so we can actually hang out together rather than just on Zoom. I hope so. So. I hope so. Well, thanks everybody for watching um, today. And um, I hope that this was clear. If it's not, I can write down some tips for you in the comment section. Please leave any questions because Coral, I'm sure, will be able to answer any extra, extra questions you have if you put them in the comment section. Um, just one note about programming what's coming up. We're going to continue with this cool idea of where in the world. Weekends are going to be just mostly for cooking, hanging out with people like Coral. Uh, but then Monday through Friday, we've decided to embark on this journey of taking you on vacation to a new destination every week. This next week's destination uh, is going to be interesting because my friend Andrew decided to go to the Balkans. So we may go to the Balkans with you this weekend. We'll see. Um, so it'll be a, a surprise, but every week from now on until I don't even know when, we're going to have a new destination with you. So uh, check back and we'll see how that all goes. So thanks everybody. And thank you, Coral. Bye. 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 Bye.